It's nearly 14 minutes past seven, and on this Christmas Eve we go to Bethlehem. Now, no doubt we'll be singing about the little town, how still we see thee lie. But alas, it's not all that still around the Church of the Holy Nativity, which stands on what is said to be the exact site of the Nativity. The rivalry between the various Christian factions who share the right to maintain it has developed into such an unholy row that Israel's border guards have been told to keep an eye on things this Christmas in case violence breaks out. Well, Paul Reynolds is on the line from Jerusalem. Paul, what's, what's the row all about there? Well, this goes back, John, many, many centuries and many, many generations, and it has to do with who controls the holy sites. And uh, under the Ottoman Empire, which used to prevail in this part of the world, uh, the, the rights uh, fluctuated. But then everything was frozen in the status quo in the mid-19th century, and the Greek Orthodox have most of the Basilica of the Holy Nativity, and the Armenians have a side chapel, and the row is about who should actually clean the entrance to the grotto, the cave in which the birth is supposed to have taken place. You may think cleaning is not very important, but in these churches, the annual cleaning ceremony, which takes place on Monday, what you clean, you own. And these rites are very important, and the Armenians and the Greeks who came to blows a couple of years ago still haven't sorted out who should clean something which is no more, I assure you, than about a foot of wall. It's absolutely incredible, but that is the situation. You say they actually came to blows. What happened? Was it serious? Yes, it was extremely serious. So what happened was the uh, Greeks put up their ladders uh, and they took uh, brooms with longer handles. And uh, believe you me, they, they, I'm not kidding when I say that they have to work out how long the broom handle can be to clean these pieces of wall. Uh, the Armenians reckon they were cleaning where they shouldn't do, so they started knocking over the ladders with the Greeks still on them. Twelve uh, people were taken to hospital. The Israeli border police, a very tough paramilitary police, uh, were sent into the church uh, to sort them out. And the military governor yesterday called in uh, the uh, Greeks and the Armenians uh, and the Franciscans who represent the Roman Catholics. They're not really involved so much. And said, look, you've really got to sort this out, boys, otherwise uh, the cleaning ceremony may not be able to go ahead on Monday. But it must be very disconcerting for uh, pilgrims to arrive at Bethlehem and find clerics thumping each other. I think this is very disappointing for people. I was shocked when I first discovered this last year. And this is a row, by the way, not confined just to the Nativity Church. Uh, there are very serious disagreements in the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem. It's very, very depressing. I was at the uh, Nativity Church last Saturday morning. Uh, there'd been a lot of rain last week, and the floor of the church was flooded with water. And uh, the roof is un... They cannot mend the roof. It's got nice rafters because they don't agree among themselves who should have the privilege of mending it, and therefore the thing leaks, and the floor is flooded with rainwater. It's, it's an absolute outrage and scandal, and really does detract from the church, and um, the church is in a very sorry state, I think, altogether. Well, let's hope the, the spirit of goodwill will pervade this Christmas, Paul. Thank you very much. Time is 17 minutes past seven. The news this morning is that after protests from MPs, there's to be an inquiry into how details of Mrs Thatcher's visit to Northern Ireland yesterday were leaked in advance. A Northern Ireland man wanted by the police in connection with terrorist bombings in the province and in England is being deported after eight years in the United States. It's understood that Peter McMullen is being sent to the Irish Republic. And there are indications that one of the French hostages held in Lebanon is about to be released as a Christmas gesture. Here's an even better headline. Disappointing, disgusting, lousy, says the wine correspondent of the Times, Jane McQuitty such language, and not about some plonk fortified with antifreeze, but about champagne. Now, I know that champagne is largely used for spraying fellow competitors in Grand Prix motor races, but it is supposed to be the champion of wines, and the champagne producers are displeased by the sniffy attitude in the Times, as Bill Frost heard in Ipanay, where they put the fizz into bubbly. Among the famous champagne houses singled out for criticism by Times correspondent Jane McQuitty are Bollinger, Mum and Lanson. But any attack on the so-called Wine of Kings is enough to unite the whole region against its detractors. André Anders is a director of the CIVC, a committee which represents the interests of producers but polices quality too. So how does Monsieur Anders react to claims of high prices and low quality? When you want to produce the best, sparkling wine in the world, you need to build a quality product, a, the highest quality product, and quality at its price. So you're not cutting corners to produce more then in the face of increased demand? You're not um, skimping on quality? Not at all, uh, simply because we know that champagne stands 
on its quality. A champagne bottling plant on a hillside overlooking Epernay. It's owned by the family Otrio. They've been here 300 years and more. Almost half the wine they produce is shipped to England. Outside France itself, the world's most thirsty consumer. Gérard Otrio says the wine of kings has never tasted more regal. C'est mieux, je dirais. C'est mieux parce que depuis plusieurs années, depuis quelques dizaines... Mr. Otrio is saying that uh, because uh, he's mastering much better the fermentation process, that he's using vines far more efficient and more even more adapted to the soil and the climate, uh, that he's saying his quality is better, even better than a few years ago. Down the valley in the heart of Epinay, where the so-called Grand Marc or large champagne houses are to be found, there's a mixture of sadness and anger over claims of extortionate pricing and poor bouquet. Christian de B is president of Paul Roger, a wine much enjoyed by the late Sir Winston Churchill. Monsieur de B points out that not every year can produce a connoisseur's vintage. Of course we have uh, good years and bad years. We rely on the nature and uh, sometimes uh, it's difficult to, to make uh, the best. But um, we, we always try to, to make a consistent good quality of champagne. La Maison Laurent Perrier, east of Epinay on the banks of the Marne, a house producing some of the most popular champagne on sale in Britain and some of the most expensive too. Managing director Bernard de la Giraudière, who's a Viscount by the way, wouldn't deny that quality from some houses at least can vary. Nonetheless, Vicomte Giraudière says Britons are generally getting a good deal. One gets what one pays for. At the moment in the British Isle, champagne is too cheap, definitely too cheap. And that is due to the fact that we naturally there is a currency variation which has been very, very strong and the British are benefiting from a lower price than anywhere else in Europe at the moment, let's face it. If you are looking just for something which is fizzy and is called champagne and is just of average or, or, or lower quality, then sometimes it is too expensive. What nettled the Champagne Kings most was the suggestion that British bibbers could get better value and the same effect from a bottle of relatively cheap, ordinary sparkling wine. If uh, that person wants the wine, the style, the myth, the legend, the gaiety, the beauty and whatever is surrounding champagne, which makes anybody drinking it slightly different after drinking than before, then that person should buy champagne. Otherwise, the choice is for sparkling wines. If it's just fun and nothing else, sparkling wine. But that's not really the people that I want to drink champagne in here. And that report came from Bill Frost. The time is 22 minutes past seven. We haven't got any business news for you this morning. We haven't got a business news man here. They've knocked off early. So we won't dwell on the horrors of the trade deficit, but we have rung around to give you the closing prices in New York and Tokyo. In New York, the Dow Industrial Average closed down at 1914.37. In Tokyo, the Nikkei Dow closed up 94.3 on the day at 18,902.85. The closing exchange rates in Tokyo were 161. 0.85 yen to the dollar, 1.4565 dollars to the pound, and 1.9710 Deutschmarks to the dollar. That makes you feel much better. Isn't, isn't that it? amazing? I don't even know whether that's good news or bad news. Let's call it good news, Christmas Eve. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have. Uh, well, no, we're not going to have. They were going to have special reports on this program from Argentina and the Philippines on how they're facing up to their particular political and economic problems. But for a while, they're trying to forget their troubles over Christmas. Philip Hay in Buenos Aires and Bill Turnbull in Manila now report. A ragged chorus of silent night from a schoolboy choir standing in the hot afternoon sun on Santa Fe, the most fashionable shopping street in Buenos Aires. Although the windows are filled with expensive food and gifts and there's no shortage of customers, it will be a quiet occasion for many Argentines this year because they can't afford a Christmas dinner. No, I'm not going to do anything special. I'll be at home with my husband and my daughter, but we're not going to do anything special. I'm going to collect my pension on the 23rd of December. With that, I have to pay the bills, taxes, and there's not going to be anything left over to buy anything special. Buenos Aires looks like Paris or London at this time of year. But Argentina is a sad country, locked in a past from which it cannot escape. Rogmore Hagelin is one of those who can never forget what happened when thousands of people were tortured and executed by the military during the late 70s. 
I strongly believe that shortly I will leave the country. I don't like to live in a country where I don't, where I cannot get justice after 10 years of struggle. There is only justice for military people. The authorities are trying to take people's minds off painful memories by putting musicians on the streets. For young people, especially girls who dress like the pop star Madonna and want to go and live in America, there's no problem. Their parents, if they're working, will have received their Christmas bonus by now and bought sparkling wine to celebrate the start of the long summer holiday. So for them, the cry, Feliz Navidad, Happy Christmas, will mean trying to forget their troubles, even if it's just for one day. Merry Christmas to you and a Happy New Year. Maligayang Pasko at manigong bagong taon. Christmas in the Philippines is a more cheerful affair. The country has a lot to celebrate. The return of democracy after two decades of the Marcos regime and the return of peace with the three-month ceasefire with communist rebels ending 17 years of guerrilla war. But don't expect to hear traditional Filipino carols in this Catholic country. For more often than not, what you get as you wander through the shopping malls and department stores is old-fashioned American pop. It's easy in this air-conditioned atmosphere to forget you're in the Far East, with tons of tinsel and plastic Christmas trees, electric Santa Claus models ringing their bells, and generous decorative coatings of artificial snow. But there is no such thing as snow in the Philippines, which leads to some interesting ideas. Do you know what snow is? We are now? Snow. It's snow. Do you know what snow is? Now, now? No, snow, snow. like snow yeah. in the Christmas decorations. Yeah, it's snow is uh, like a uh, fog. Like yeah. fog. Yeah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. One original decoration you can find, though, is the colourful Christmas lantern. Hung everywhere from street lamps and office buildings, hotel lobbies and living rooms, they range in size from 9 inches to 12 feet. Artenio Tagodin's lantern factory and sales floor is an archway underneath a motorway bridge. They are a uh, tissue, Japanese paper, bamboo. So it's a star in a, in a circle. It, maybe it's the star of Bethlehem. Maybe. You're not sure? I'm not sure, but uh, maybe it's the start from the Bethlehem, from the Three Kings. Those reports were from Bill Temple in Manila and Philip Hay in Buenos Aires, and you'll be hearing from both after Christmas. Time now, 26 and a half minutes past seven. We can't put it off any longer. Here's Colville. And within the last 20 minutes, white smoke has been seen emanating from Mike Gatting's hotel room in Melbourne. Not another drug scandal, or not, an, not at all a drug scandal, I'm happy to say. Just Gatting and his selection committee have finally come up with a squad for the fourth test, which starts on Boxing Day. Big was the one that got away, they're all crying. Now, the weather forecast, much of England and Wales will start rather cold and cloudy, but the milder wet weather over Northern Ireland and Western Scotland will spread to the rest of the country during the day. And the outlook for Christmas Day, if you were betting there'd be snow, I'm afraid you've lost. It's going to be mild and unsettled with rain. You're listening to Today on Radio 4 with John Timpson and Brian Redhead. The time is just turned half past seven. Between now and eight o'clock, we shall discuss petrol, gas, water and the Holy Spirit. The news this morning after protests from MPs, the Northern Ireland office has confirmed that there'll be an inquiry into how the details of Mrs Thatcher's visit to the province yesterday were leaked in advance. After eight years in America, Peter McMullen, wanted by police in connection with bombings in Northern Ireland and in Yorkshire, is being deported to the Irish Republic. And there are indications that one of the French television men being held hostage in Lebanon will be released as a Christmas gesture. And now it's time for Thought for the Day. We're joined again this morning by the Reverend Dr John Stott, the Rector Emeritus of All Souls Langham Place. Good morning. Good morning. The fundamental meaning of Christmas is that through Jesus Christ, God actually entered our world and became one of us. But how did he do it? The Christian answer is that he was born into the world, born of a human mother, born indeed of a virgin. Of course, from time to time, there's a hullabaloo in the church about the virgin birth. So I thought I'd mention just two of the church's convictions about it, namely that it's true and that it's appropriate. First, it's true. It actually happened. Our Christian foundation documents bear witness to it. The only two Gospels which record the birth of Jesus, Matthew and Luke, both say that he was born of a virgin. 
And Luke prefaces his gospel with a strong statement that he checked his sources and investigated everything carefully. He wasn't writing myth or midrash, but history. What seems particularly strange is that some Christians accept the greater miracle of the Incarnation, that God became a human being in Jesus, but stumble over the smaller miracle of the virgin birth, which has to do with the mechanics of the Incarnation, if I may use that word. But if the virgin birth is historically true, it's also theologically appropriate. It makes sense. But consider what it secured. On the one hand, Mary was told that she would conceive in her womb and bear a son, so that he would inherit from her his humanity and his title to the throne of David. On the other hand, the Holy Spirit would come upon her and the creative power of God would overshadow her so that her child would be unique, the Holy One, without sin and the Son of God. As a result of the virgin birth, you see, Jesus enjoyed both a continuity with the human race and a discontinuity. He was one of us and at the same time distinct from us for he was simultaneously Mary's son and God's son, human and divine, the Messiah descended from David and the sinless saviour of sinners. Mary's response to this stupendous message was beautifully modest. She didn't argue, she submitted. I am the Lord's servant, where her words, may it be to me as you have said. Tomorrow, when we celebrate Jesus Christ's birth of the Virgin Mary, I think we need something of her humility. The speaker in the thought for the day this morning was the Reverend Dr. John Stott. It's uh, just after 11 minutes to 8. We've been carrying reports these last few days from the divided cities of the world, places like Berlin and Londonderry, and today, appropriately, we turn to Jerusalem, where there's been renewed tension between Jew and Arab these past few weeks. Uh, we've already heard this morning from our correspondent there, Paul Reynolds, about divisions in Bethlehem. Paul has lived in Jerusalem for over a year now, and he has sent us this report. I'm standing on the Mount of Olives, looking down at one of the most beautiful views in the world. The old city of Jerusalem, dominated by the great golden dome of the rock, is in the foreground. Behind, the modern city of Jerusalem stretches into the distant Judean hills. To the left, on the horizon, are the outlines of the mountains of Moab across the River Jordan. So much history has been played out on this stage, and so much religion has been formed here, that one stands in awe. Given the passions and rivalries, it's not surprising that Jerusalem has seen so much conflict. cantor in Jerusalem's great synagogue. For the Jews, it is now unthinkable that sovereignty over Jerusalem be given up. For the Arabs, the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third most holy shrine in Islam, and Jerusalem is also a political symbol. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the bells of the Holy Sepulchre Church affirm the holiness of Jerusalem for Christianity. But in Jerusalem, religious commitment and political passions are close allies, and at times they get mixed up and spill over into violence. How to keep these volcanic rumblings from exploding has been the task of the mayor, Teddy Kollek, ever since the War of 67, which brought the whole of Jerusalem under Israeli control. His philosophy has been quite clear. Jewish sovereignty, Kollek says, is not in doubt, but within that framework, the sensibilities of the different communities must be recognized. Jerusalem is the dream of the Jews for 2,000 years and uh, it fell into our hands, so what should we do? Not fulfill our dreams? We haven't solved all the problems uh, of a united city, but you won't find anybody who, who will not tell you that it's a better city united than it was divided. But do you think it's united psychologically? Certainly not, nor have we ever 
attempted this, you know. This is uh, a city which is not a melting pot, uh, but a mosaic. One belief unites all Jews about Jerusalem. It should never be divided again. Hannah Tokatli's family has lived in the city for more than a hundred years. She recalls the Arab riots of 1929 when, as a six-month-old child, she was saved by her mother. Suddenly my mother remembered that it, I was in the carriage in the front room and that a, a stone or something can be thrown on me. So she quickly went to the room and took me out of the cradle. And when the rioters went away, and uh, so uh, my parents went into the room and they saw a big stone in my cradle that could kill me if I was still there. And that's what I remember. Jerusalem is not physically divided. I'm driving now from West Jerusalem, where most of the Jews live, into the much smaller Arab East Jerusalem. In Jerusalem's population of 450,000, Jews outnumber the Arabs three to one. This is a road where there's been a lot of tension recently. Jews have been stoning Arab cars in retaliation for the stabbing to death of a young Jewish religious student in the old city. But there are no barriers on this road, no so-called peace line. And from the modern blocks of flats I'm just leaving behind, I'm crossing now a hundred yards or so of rocky, empty ground, a kind of no man's land, and suddenly everything is different. The Arab houses I'm just passing are older and much bigger. The people here dress differently, they speak differently, and they think differently. It's quite clearly a divided city, not in the sense of uh, barriers and uh, barbed wire, but in the sense of differences of cultures, of, of uh, uh, civilization. Daoud Kutab is a young Palestinian journalist. His family too goes back several generations in Jerusalem. When we drive in the west side we feel like we are in another world. Uh, I'm afraid that my car would have a flat tire and I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know how to talk to the people if I have problems. I mean we feel that we in Jerusalem are part of the occupied territories and we feel a, a major national struggle for liberation, for determining our future. That report from Paul Reynolds in Jerusalem. Let me just pass on a little Christmas story to you from the Financial Times. One of the staff there is having great trouble buying a Christmas present for his five-year-old son because whenever he asks the boy what he'd like from Father Christmas, the boy shakes his head and says, I'm not going to tell you, it's still a secret. It's uh, five to eight now. Time for the weather forecast. Uh, not a snowflake in sight, I fear. Frank Green at the London Weather Centre. You may remember that uh, just before the end of yesterday's programme, we told you that Mrs Thatcher had just arrived in Northern Ireland for a Christmas visit. That was the first we were told of it, for obvious security reasons. But as you've heard, the full details of the Prime Minister's itinerary had already reached a morning paper in the province, the Belfast Newsletter. They'd been supplied by the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, Dr Ian Paisley. Happily, the visit passed off without incident, but there have been serious complaints that Dr Paisley had endangered Mrs Thatcher by passing on the information, and there's to be an inquiry into how he got it. Tim Maybe reports. Dr Paisley is unrepentant about having breached any security. His intention was quite simply to give opponents of the Anglo-Irish agreement a chance to demonstrate against Mrs Thatcher. I told the newsletter that uh, the Prime Minister would be coming and I told the, the, the newsletter of the places that she would be visiting. And the Northern Ireland office, Tom King, issued a statement saying that she wasn't coming. So now they're caught out in their own lie. And that's why they're so angry. And what is more, does Mrs Thatcher think that she's better than Her Gracious Majesty Queen Elizabeth II? When the Queen comes, her itinerary is known. And those meeting her are informed of her coming. The complaints against Dr Paisley have come from members of the Conservative Party, among them Sir Humphrey Atkins, a former Northern Ireland secretary. To give details of the Prime Minister's itinerary on a visit to Northern Ireland can only make life that much more dangerous for her. We all know perfectly well there are enemies of the Prime Minister uh, who would be anxious to interrupt her visit, if not do her physical damage. And that is what I cannot understand in Dr. Paisley. He professes to be the strongest supporter of the union with the United Kingdom. She is the properly elected Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and he does something that makes life more dangerous for her. Then I can only deplore it. He's got plenty of other opportunity if he chooses to use it to make his point. For example, he could come to the House of Commons and make it there, but he chooses not to. Sir Humphrey particularly wants to know how Dr. Paisley found out about the trip. 
advanced knowledge of such visits is usually restricted to a handful of people in the Northern Ireland office and the security forces. Dr Paisley won't say how he found out, but other DUP members say he was told by someone in the Northern Ireland office. So the Secretary of State has ordered an inquiry into the leak. Dr Paisley is well satisfied with his actions. Now they were going to attempt to have her appear in the centre of Royal Avenue and to say, oh, there's no opposition to the Anglo-Irish Agreement. So I was simply saying to the people, look, this is the dodge that they're up to, be alerted. Well, of course, she didn't appear in the centre of Belfast. Do you not think that you endangered her life at all? Mrs Thatcher had absolute protection in Northern Ireland. She was completely surrounded everywhere she went She's no better than the ordinary woman of Northern Ireland who don't get any protection. She's no better than my own colleague, uh, Mr. Peter Robinson, whom Mrs. Thatcher ordered that his protection be taken off him and that his wife and family be left a prey to the IRA. You would agree that Mrs. Thatcher would be a target to people that you yourself dislike? She isn't as great a target to them as I am. And certainly, I don't get the protection that was given her today. So she was absolutely safe. Ian Paisley in the time is 14 minutes past eight. Well, reports this morning suggest that one of the French hostages held in Lebanon will soon be released as a Christmas goodwill gesture. And with us is Terry Waite, the Archbishop of Canterbury's special envoy. Are you on your way back? Are you on standby to go to Lebanon? Well, I'm on standby, Brian, because uh, at the moment uh, it's not been possible to get back before Christmas. I hope that would be possible, but... At the moment, uh, I'm trying to arrange local security, and that's not being guaranteed. And so until that's guaranteed, it's unwise to go back. Now, if they release one Frenchman, I think that leaves about 18 hostages still in captivity. It certainly does, and the majority of those people, I mean, nothing has been heard about them for a long time, and uh, a couple of them, uh, well, for instance, Alec Collette, there's the reports that he's been killed, but again, there's no proof positive that he's dead. Um, he may still be alive. It's a slim hope. But obviously that sort of a situation puts his family in a very miserable position. And Francis Gallagher, who's the British Charge Affair there, has, has appealed this morning for the release of Collett and of John McCarthy. Yes, that's right. Uh, but who's Mr Keaton from Belfast? Now, he's got an Irish passport. Why is he being held? Uh, again, it's difficult to know why people are being held. You see, people are held for, for roughly a, a couple of reasons. One, they're held by groups who hold them for political motive, who've got certain political ends to pursue and will pursue those ends ruthlessly. And then there are other groups who hold people for a long period of time uh, simply to hope to get cash for them, to sell them to a political group or to sell them to the highest bidder. And I think that's the case with a number of hostages. I mean, we have evidence that uh, bids have been put in. And, of course, uh, that puts everybody in an extraordinarily difficult position. We just don't know. But a man like Francis Gallagher wouldn't make a, an appeal unless he had reason to believe that it was worth making the appeal at this moment. Well, it is worth making an appeal at Christmas time. Um, because uh, traditionally in Islam, uh, religious festivals are, are recognized, honored, and traditionally in Islam, there are times when there can be a release or sometimes in, uh, an exchange. And uh, I think we simply have to take advantage of that particular se this particular season of the year to make, again, a renewed appeal. What we have to remember is that innocent people are being held, and uh, these men are, are not guilty of any crime. They're just being held for ransom, and it's totally wrong to hold them. Do you need guarantees about your own safety before you go again? Well, I think the, the real difficulty is this, that, uh, as you know, Beirut is held, uh, the territory is held by different groups of militiamen, and uh, you have to put yourself into the hands of one of those groups and be able to get across Beirut, and then once you're in the uh, centre of town, have guarantees to get you to the various people you want to see. And until you can get those guarantees, it really, it's a bit unwise to, to move, really. But are your credentials with the people who hold them captive... Are they as good as they were in the light of the Iranian business? Yes, yeah, I think they are. I mean, I've, I've been checking that out in the last couple of weeks, and I've been saying to people out there, you know, what, what, are, what are the stories? And uh, apparently my credentials are good. It is still recognised, uh, quite rightly, that my mission is a humanitarian mission, that I'm acting independently, and whilst naturally you have to relate to the governments of who's, uh, who, uh, like the American government, where Americans are held hostage, that I'm not in the employ or dictated to by those governments, so I'm still clear on that. And ready to go in any minute. Absolutely, yes.
Terry Wade, thank you. 21 minutes past eight, time for sport. Mr Colville has arrived wearing a scarf. I think he's anxious to get off on holiday. <laughs> this morning's hot news from Australia. England have named a squad of 13 for the fourth test in Melbourne. It reads Broad, Athy, Gatting, Gower, Lamb, Botham, Richards, Embry and Edmonds, De Freitas, Dilly, Foster and Small. That match starts in the early hours of Boxing Day. Well, Sir Reginald is in our radio car, and Dr Abdullah is in our Merseyside studio. And if I may start with you, Sir Reginald, why is it that you want this rule reviewed? May I please explain to you that on Sunday afternoon I was phoned by TV AM, who asked me to appear on a program yesterday morning. I told them that it would not be possible because I was leading a team and that we had already arranged a press conference for Wednesday morning. And nearly a minute I later, Sir Reginald was still refusing to answer the question. To, uh, TV AM what are we leading up to, Sir Reginald? I said I would not be in London. An hour or so later, your own producer, Mr. Roderick Pounsett, phoned me personally. What, why are we nice having this history, Sir Reginald? Again. What, what is the point of all this, if uh, I may? Uh, there's a great deal of point to it, sir, because you have quite correctly reported me that there is great concern among doctors about this rule. Yes. And I went on to say to get 2,000 doctors to agree on anything is really quite remarkable. Indeed. And uh, th those, um, your radio car has such bad lighting, I can't see. If you'll now put Dr. Abdullah on, I will answer anything she has to say. Dr. Abdullah there, I'd be very pleased to hear from her. Well, I think we all would after that. Then there was the time when John tried his hand, or rather tried his tongue, at the universal language of Esperanto. Caregai auscultantoi ni sandas alvi bondesiroin o case de la semino de internatia amicatso, which I'm assured means, dear listeners, we send you good wishes on the occasion of the week of international friendship. Now, Mr. Brian Barker of the British Esperanto Society has been looking at me faintly in horror. I must have got some of that wrong, I suspect. Um, to an extent, yes, but you're improving. Well, a tongue-twisting trial, but then, of course, there's trial by politician. Now, John has interviewed many over these past few years. But perhaps he remembers this tussle more vividly than most. The cost? What was the cost of achieving it, Mr. Timpson? Well, so the cost, I sort of thought, would be quoted as uh, some three and a half or whatever figure is the latest figure. Well, really I'm, unemployed. Uh, well, of course, you would be entirely wrong to say that, wouldn't you? Because if we hadn't controlled inflation, Lord knows what unemployment would have been. The unemployment we see is the cost of past inflation. Um, but does every piece of infrastructure have to be financed by the government? Is it only good infrastructure if it's financed by the taxpayer? No, fair enough. Well, now, let's take the other expenditure that people are worried about, expenditure on education. Now, we've got a new education... No, that, no, right? no, with respect, they're not worried about expenditure on education. Oh, I think they are. No, 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 I'm, no, I'm terribly sorry, Mr Timpson, they're not. They're worried about the standards of education. No, they're worried about them needing more money to improve conditions at school. No, 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 Mr Timpson, I do beg you to get it right. <laughs> so, 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 let's have a fair crack at the whip on your programme this morning, about a disgraceful affair in the school where the uh, teachers have been forced out by the fact that the local authority would not back them in keeping discipline in the school. Now, that's nothing to do with money, but it's ruining education. It's all right for me to ask a question. Oh, Sorry, indeed, I want to indeed. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we can't forget one of the great all-time funnies, the operatic parrot. And uh, he's poised in front of the microphone. Is there any likelihood, because these things never do happen when you want them to, is he going to talk to us, do you think? Well, I think he's got so much to entertain him. At the moment, he's uh, very busy looking at everything. He may well do. Mm -hmm. It's um, a little early in the morning. He's been talking to the London taxis. <laughs> yes. He thought that was great fun. How do you set him off? Is there something you can say? Or... Uh, not really. He likes music, and... Um, if a certain piece of music takes his fancy, he thinks that um, he'll have a sing and then he overtakes it. Oh. <laughs> I still think it was you. <laughs> Dinner which I shall remember most happily, the parrot or Mr. Tevitt. Now, the weather forecast. Much of England and Wales will start rather cloudy and cold, but the milder wet weather over Northern Ireland and Western Scotland will spread to the rest of the country during the day, and it's going to be a mild Christmas day. The quick rundown of the news with David Simons. After protests from MPs, the Northern Ireland office has confirmed that there will be an inquiry into how details of Mrs. Thatcher's visit to the province yesterday were leaked in advance to Mr. Paisley. The Prime Minister has again told the Falkland Islanders there will be no negotiating on sovereignty. 
There are indications that one of the French television men being held prisoner in Lebanon may be released as a Christmas gesture. At the same time, the Chargé d'Affaires in Beirut has made a newspaper appeal for the release of two hostages, John McCarthy and Alec Collett. On the foreign exchanges, the pound has strengthened slightly, up to uh, $1.45.5. Uh, letting me say goodbye on this occasion, so may I just say thank you to all those good wishes that have come in uh, in the post and indeed on the phone during the course of this programme. Uh, may I say uh, from the Today team and on this occasion to the Today team, a very happy Christmas, a very good morning to you and goodbye. Well, usually at this point we roll the credits, but before we do, John, this is Charlotte Green on behalf of the newsreaders and what's on Radio 4 is... For the girls, and this is Peter Jefferson on behalf of the uh, blokes, wishing you, John, all the very best. And look forward to hearing you, of course, with your other hat on. Thank you, girls and boys. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> Bye-bye. 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 Today's editors were Peter Gallimore and Sue Bonner. Studio production was by Tracy Hobbs.